I just wanted to talk about this. This is, this happened in 1949. This is one of Eastern Kentucky, and probably one of Kentucky uh, overall is, um, oldest unsolved murders. This took place in Floyd County, Kentucky, which it. And I'm reading this from Reddit from the user page of Kitty Cat 420. I don't have no idea who that is. I just started researching this because I've heard about this throughout my life. And so I was looking for information on it. And this is told, this is from the, um, the story being told here is from someone who is from Prestonsburg and grew up hearing about this. And they wanted to share what they knew about it. So June the 27th, a pretty high school cheerleader in my sleepy hometown. Now keep in mind, as I'm reading this, and I refer to me or my or I, I'm reading this from the viewpoint of this person on Reddit, so it's not me telling this story. The event that happened when my mother was a few months old was such a big event growing up, I heard about it throughout my life. The death, a murder, is still unsolved 72 years later and sadly will probably never be solved. I will attempt to tell her story based on both sources I've seen online and based on things I know just from the information of my hometown. I will try to make clear what elements are facts and what elements are rumor or theory. There were two primary suspects of the crime, although both of them were ultimately freed. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now, and we'll come back to that. Although I was born decades after this happened, the story has always been a big part of life in Prestonsburg, Kentucky. I know my small town experience is not unique in the fact that tragedies live on in the memories of so many. There were three fairly major tragedies that occurred within a span of eight years in Prestonsburg, Kentucky, or Floyd County. And one tragedy, the biggest tragedy, probably one of the biggest tragedies that ever occurred in Kentucky was 1957 Floyd County school bus crash. Uh, they, they commemorate this every year. They do a memorial to these people every year. Uh, tw I think it was 26 students on the school bus and the driver. Um, it was the second deadliest bus crash to this day in history, and I remember all the, you know, I mean, I don't remember it, of course, but I remember all the talk about it throughout the years, and it's, like I said, it's well known in this area brought in. And the other tragedy that's mentioned here was that two young boys, um, after a high school football game, or after a football game, um, were taking showers and died from carbon monoxide poisoning or something in 54. And then, of course, the Muriel Baldridge story. Now, Muriel Baldridge was a 17-year-old high school cheerleader from Prestonsburg, Kentucky. Um, Muriel was the youngest of her parents, George and Bertha Baldridge. She had three sisters and two older brothers who had all already moved out and left the home. She was the only one left at home, although one sister had returned after divorcing her husband and brought her three children. Muriel's dad worked at the local railroad office and provided a good living for his family. As with many small towns, much of the social life of the town revolved around high school sports teams. Prestonsburg was then and always has been a football powerhouse and Friday nights in the fall were consumed with going to local football games for generations in this town. Now let me put in my own two cents here. I have myself gone to Prestonsburg High School football games. I really haven't followed football much in the last few years, but uh, Prestonsburg Black Cats were a powerhouse football team. They they're, they're, they rank pretty high up there in this region. Um, I've, I've watched them play against my own homeschool team and uh, usually 
Preston's bird always would win, you know. But uh, anyway, that's just something I wanted to throw in there as my own uh, knowledge of this town and the knowledge of this area. Um, so Muriel was a pretty 17-year-old with light brown hair, and she was a cheerleader at the local high school. By all accounts, she was liked and had many friends. To this day, late June into the early part of July, the fourth holiday brings a carnival to town. On Muriel's last night alive, she and three friends went to a local movie theater, the Abigail Movie Theater, a movie that was um, a theater that was replaced. This place is at what they're talking about. So Muriel had borrowed a dress from her sister and was fixed up for the night out with her friends. They had gone to the movie theater and afterwards gone to the local carnival. As Muriel and her friends walked near her home, they parted ways on the West Prestonsburg Bridge, an iconic symbol of Prestonsburg for its unique rainbow arch. Muriel planned on crossing the bridge as a short cut back to her home. I've heard all of my life that one of her friends had offered to walk with her all the way home but she told them to go ahead. She had done this many times, so she wasn't afraid. Small town, 1949, you know, I mean, I guess she had walked home to and from the town and the school so often. This was the last confirmed time that anyone had seen Muriel alive. I could not find any reports of her parents reporting her missing that evening but it may be reasonable to assume that they figured that she had gone to spend the night with one of her girlfriends. Phones were not very common then, and this being a very small, safe town, the child, the child would have likely gone for a longer period of time before anyone would think to be alarmed. Early the next morning, Muriel was discovered under the bridge, although not submerged in water. A bus driver first noticed her, and quickly, many people were buzzing around. My preschool Sundays, um, skip over that part, it's just, this person's just telling something about their own input. The story that I have always heard was that the bus driver had stopped to scope out a fishing spot that he planned on fishing that week. He initially thought that someone had jumped off of the bridge but later discovered that not to be the case. Alcohol bottles were found near the body, which is an important note later in this discussion. An ambulance was quickly called for the girl to be moved to a local funeral home. Although an official death notice had not been made, her parents were, quick, were quickly made aware that it was her and I believe they could have uh, seen the chaos from their front porch. This is how close this girl was to her home, that her parents could just about see the location of where her body was discovered here. Um, I'm almost certain that the house they lived in has been torn down. For some strange reason, instead of her parents making the official ID of her body, Police instead went to the home of one of the young friends who had been with her that night and brought her down to ID the body. Now, I don't understand this at the time. I don't, I mean, I, I, this would never happen today, and I cannot understand why, what the police were thinking at that time. But, you know, I don't know, but they said that this girl was even younger than Muriel and was only 15 years old and was asked to come and ID this girl's body. Maybe they wanted to spare the parents, but to put that off on a 15-year-old child seems pretty bizarre to me. I also remember hearing, and I'm not sure of this, was before or after the official ID, but very soon after her discovery that the family just knew from the chaos the the mother asked the father to walk down and see what was going on. So, you know, he would have walked upon this, you know, and seen his daughter there, seen people buzzing around. 
Muriel's funeral brought out the community, and attendance was about double the population of Prestonsburg. Muriel had an autopsy, although I'm sure in 1949 autopsies were different. They were probably not looking for DNA. Of course, you know, DNA had not come into play at that time. They may have been looking for blood, or I don't know if they would have been scraping the fingernails or anything like that at that time, you know, because they do that to search for DNA, for skin cells and such, but in 1949 and in a small town like Prestonsburg, I kind of don't really know that they would have done that. It was determined that the blows to the face and head were her official cause of death. Um, she had five skull fractures as a result of the brutality. Curiosity, there was no real talk that I could see of any sort of sexual assault. But whether or not she was raped is it was in the autopsy that she wasn't, but just how how much did they really search is the is the question. This is pure speculation on my part, but I honestly think that the community, including the law enforcement, were so shocked with the brutality of this crime that they thought it was impossible to even consider that she had been sexually assaulted. Now, I know nothing has ever been published stating that she was, but in my opinion, I believe that she probably was sexually assaulted, and it being 1949, and sex and sexual assaults and things like that were still taboo and hush-hush, that maybe to spur the feelings of the other girls in the community and the mother, they just glossed over that. Um, that's kind of this person's belief, and I kind of feel the same way. I believe they saw the skull fractures were probably very visible, and just, just and just said, "This is the cause of death, and let's move on." It was summertime. There was a carnival nearby, and teens and children were out running around, and nobody. It didn't set off any alarms. Now here we here we come back to the suspects. Initially, a young man that had literally just left town to move to Texas confessed to the crime, but recanted as soon as he got into town to say he had only confessed in order to have a ride back to Prestonsburg. <laughs> okay, oh, I murdered somebody. Oh, by the way, I did murder somebody. Donald Dutney Horn did, did know Muriel and, in fact, had seen her that night. Right before he left town, which was either the same day or the day that she died, they were, okay, let me rephrase this. Donald Dutney Horn didn't know her and, in fact, had seen her just before he left town, which was either that day or the day before she died. They were friendly with one another, and I believe they even may have dated a little. However, his him recanting, his story was accepted by the police, and he was able to leave and go back to Texas. So why did he want to come back to Prestonsburg and then turn right around and go back to Texas? Later, I heard that he didn't so much as confess as he just said that he knew he was wanted for questioning. So that was the reason that he asked for a ride back home. A young carnival worker, o Olin Collins, Olin was from nearby McGoffin County, but working on the carnival and was only 15 years old. Gamble was brought in for questioning the first night, and he did sign a confession. What is wrong with all these people? He, he recanted this confession almost immediately. He said that he could not have written the confession because he was illiterate. So someone else wrote out the confession and asked him to make his mark on it. And as soon as he did, he said, I don't know what this says because I cannot read. He was arrested, but he was allowed to go free. This pair continues to be a suspect in my opinion, although they were not suspects that were really 
sought after by the police. The police didn't really, even though they had this guy sign a confession, they later said they didn't really think that they did it, so they just, you know, um, I was very little, and I was always warned and told to be careful of carnival workers because the rumor had gone around Prestonsburg and Floyd County so much that these carnival workers were responsible for her death that every year when the carnival would come to town, parents were more apt to keep an eye on their kids. And, and not. In my opinion, the most likely suspect was a man named Lon Moles who was brought to trial with E.K. Dotson. Both of these men were older and respected members of the community. Lon served as a member of the local board of education and worked directly with Muriel's father at the railroad office. A rumor I had always heard was that Lon was kind of creepy around young girls, and he was very friendly with Muriel whenever he would be around her. She, he would, she would come to visit her father at the local railroad office, which was within sight of his home. And this is the reason why Lon Moles was a suspect, um, because he was kind of known to kind of creep this girl out and creep other girls out. And because he lived so, or he, his office was so close to where this took place, that the theory is that maybe he was there that night, saw her, and took the opportunity. And maybe the reason that he killed her was because he, he knew she could ID, identify him. The investigation into these two individuals included the usage of something you rarely ever hear of these days, truth serum. <laughs> I watched a case on YouTube the other night that went way back. I don't remember what it was about but they were using truth serum on these people, and it was probably in the 50s. Due to the proximity of the crime to Dotson's house, as well as reports of hearing screams, he was heavily questioned. He was indicated, he indicated guilt with the truth serum. Of course, one would have to question the reliability. In 1949, Floyd County, of which Prestonsburg is the county seat, as well as most surrounding counties, was dry. Now here we come back to the alcohol bottles. Imbibers would either travel to a county that was wet or rely on a bootlegger. Lawn moles drank on a regular basis and, was a, and had a fairly regular bootlegger that he used named Clyde Goodsey. Lawn had a distinct alcohol that he preferred which from what I understand was the most commonly chosen to buy, it was called Four Roses. At the scene of Muriel's death, this, is, this distinctive brand of alcohol, an empty pint bottle was found. Now today, they would have taken that bottle and did a DNA testing on it, and they would have tested for saliva and, and um, you know, DNA. But back then, they didn't have DNA, so, and they probably didn't even pick the bottle up, honestly. Um, that, of course, in itself isn't damning, but the testimony of the bootlegger was. Godsey, the bootlegger, testified that Lon had come to his home earlier that evening and had bought a pint of this Four Roses alcohol. It was speculated that Muriel died sometime between 10 and 10.30 that evening, that night. Both Goodsey and his wife said that he asked them not to turn on the lights when he came to buy the alcohol. Mistress, Mrs. Goodsey had to make change for a 20 and testified that she saw blood stains on his shirt. Now, this would have been around midnight, so now did he go back to the scene of the crime? I don't understand this. They're saying that the, they speculated the girl died between 10 and 10.30, and yet the bootlegger says he came to their home around midnight to buy a pint of this Four Roses alcohol. So did he go back 
Did he go back to the scene of this crime to make sure that she was really dead? Because they said that he returned four hours later. He comes for another pint and asked if anyone else had been there buying off of them that night. He told the Goodsies to remember he was never there when he left. Of course, as bootlegging goes, they were not going to go out and tell people they were bootlegging, so, you know, that's that. Other reports indicated that he had scratches on his arm in the days leading after the murder. A service station owner testified that he came into the station after the murder had happened to have the seats in his car redone and that there was staining on the seats consistent with blood. Now, why didn't these people, you know, I don't, I mean, like I said, today it would be a simple case of DNA, but I, I don't understand this. She's walking across the Prestonsburg Bridge. Her body is later found under that bridge. Did he come across the bridge in his car and pick her up and murder her in his car and then drove to the bootleggers and bought him a pint of liquor and then drove back and dumped her body under the bridge? Or did he dump her body under the bridge and then drive to the bootlegger and then go back and then go back to the bootlegger again? So... You know, it's kind of confusing. But, like I said, today, DNA would have been the very first thing that they would have looked at on the seats. If the car, if they brought the car in to be reupholstered to get blood stains out, that would automatically have been, you know, a, a suspicious. So, Moles testified that he had been in bed during the entire night of the night of the murder. His wife testified that she had been awake most of the night due to arthritic pain on slept the entire night. After two hours of jury deliber deliberation, the jury returned a shocking not guilty verdict. He was set free and the trial against Dotson was stopped this time because the only reason Dotson had been implicated was because of his connection, I guess, to the other man. And um, the truth serum had been really the only evidence that they had against this other man, this, this Dotson. And really, honestly, truth serum is about the same as a lie detector test. It, it's probably inadmissible in court. It was kind of junk science. Um, so this was really the only thing that they had to go on with this guy. But they had all this blood and all these people testifying that this other guy came in with blood on their clothes and scratches and blood in their car and all this other stuff. And yet he's set free and this guy maybe is a little off in his answers under this truth serum that we don't even know what the hell that really even is. But inexpl inexplicably, after the trial... All evidence was destroyed other than the dress Muriel was wearing, which had already been given to her family. We, we are outraged by this today. We, we look at this and say, why in the world did they get rid of this evidence? Well, at that time, they weren't thinking 50 or 60 or 30 or 40 years from now, there's going to be these scientific breakthroughs of DNA, and they're going to be able to match people on these genealogy bases, you know, on these websites. They didn't know about any of that, so they had no reason, really. Um, now, I'm going to finish this up with this next part, and then I'll come back and do the wrap-up of it. Nothing else, <clears throat> excuse my voice, nothing else has ever been brought forward with this crime. No other trials or suspects no true detective work has ever happened since then. My strong opinion is that they arrested the right guy, Lon Moles. The jury just didn't get the facts of the verdict. Part of this mostly due to his standing in the community and that the trial happened in nearby Pike County and that the two small towns are fairly linked, and they are. Pike County and Floyd County are, are borders, you know, and... People live in Pike County and Floyd County back and forth, and 
you know, um, the crime itself was unthinkable. Believing that it was done by one of their own was just too much for people to even consider. And the fact that he sat on the school board, worked at the railroad office, and was well known in the community. As the 70th anniversary nears, I think that sadly it's safe to say that the crime will never be truly solved. Any suspects are long dead. Moles was 60 when the trial occurred. Muriel's parents and siblings are all deceased. All evidence is long gone. The community itself, however, will never forget the pretty cheerleader whose life was tragically cut too short. Pictures of Muriel are forever branded into my memories as well as the collective memories of the community. The pretty curly-haired Muriel beaming from her Prestonsburg High School cheer uniform surrounded by her friends are a reminder that life is just fleeting. You know, she was out with her friends enjoying the summer night, um, carefree and fancy free or whatever, and was going home to turn in for the night like good girls did. and. Uh, she was just taken, and the person responsible for it very likely stood trial. They, they had plenty of evidence against the man. If this took place today, it would be almost inevitable that he would be found guilty. A further tragedy to this is that George, her father, continued to have to work alongside Lon until his retirement. I'm not sure if George believed that this man was responsible for his daughter's death, and if he ever dismissed him as if he ever dismissed him as a suspect, I do not know. But rumor is is that he did believe Lon was guilty. And I can't imagine burying my child at such a young age after such a cruel death and having to continue to work with the man that probably murdered her. Um, I hope that as these parents joined their young daughter in the afterlife that they found peace. Here's from a different story, a different article. Evidence gathered at the crime scene included, I see this wasn't mentioned in the other story, included an eight-inch lead pipe believed to have been the murder weapon and several footprints near the body and an empty whiskey bottle. Two people, a former carnival worker and a young man from a, see, a young man from a prominent Pike County family confessed to killing Baldridge but later withdrew their statements. You know, these types of things play on my mind. I think about it. Uh, right now, this little girl, Summer Wells, is missing down in Tennessee. There's not been a whole lot more talk about her. There are children and women and men, too, who go missing all over this world, all over this country, and they're never, ever, or they're, they're murdered, and they're never, nothing's ever solved. Now, had the evidence of this young woman's murder been kept in a box somewhere, blood samples and the liquor bottle and all that stuff had been kept, it's very possible that today they could solve this crime using the genealogy databases and the DNA that people send in to try to find their ancestors, just like other crimes have been solved, the Golden State murders. and. Um, but it's sad to think that this case will probably never be solved because the evidence was destroyed.